Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue reporting for Medscape. We're here in Philadelphia at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions, and one of the big stories has been orbited to. Primary results have been presented. So joining me here today are Rasha Alame, um, as well as Chris Raj Kumar, both from Imperial College in the UK. And we'll be talking about Orbita 2, but perhaps just to set the stage, Russia, where were we at after Orbita 1? What were the takeaways there? Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for having us here. Um, so I guess after Orbita 1, I mean, you will remember well the fallout that came. So obviously it was the first placebo-controlled trial of stable coronary artery disease and percutaneous coronary intervention, comparing PCI to a placebo procedure in patients who had guideline-directed medical therapy. And importantly, the patients were on an average of three antianginal agents prior to being randomized. And what we found was that the benefit of angioplasty above placebo was far smaller than we expected. And in fact, not statistically significant on the primary endpoint of exercise time. And broadly, there was very little to talk to in terms of symptoms. One in five more patients were free of angina, but otherwise all the symptom and quality of life endpoints did not show a benefit for the PCI arm. It was followed on by ischemia, and people started to think about the, the role of angioplasty in stable coronary artery disease. And for us, it was still important to think about symptoms and think about which patients might benefit from angioplasty, because we'd seen a signal that there was some benefit in those orbiter patients, but just not in all of them. And so that kind of got us thinking about what, what factors of orbiter one contributed to that surprising result. And for me, one of the factors that felt most important was the fact that they were on such high levels of antianginal medication, probably levels that are not what we're doing in the real world. Well, that's certainly what the data tells us. And that our patients were telling us was, many of them, too much for them and something that was difficult to sustain and adhere to over the long time. And so the question became, well, what does angioplasty do in a more real world setting? In a setting for patients with, without antianginal medication, and importantly, that question and designing that way would allow us to just work out the efficacy of angioplasty without any attenuating effects of medical therapy. And so that's kind of what brought us to Orbiter 2. I think, you know, Orbit has certainly got a lot of people talking. As you say, it's the first time that we really had, you know, how, however you want to describe it, but a sham procedure in yeah. essence. And I think that after Courage, there was, you know, some acceptance of the fact that, okay, perhaps for a stable angina patient, um, doing a PCI may not reduce their risk of, of having death or MI, but certainly we believed that it was going to offer symptomatic relief. I think after Orbita 1, people paused a little bit and said, gee, you know, if there's actually uh, essentially a sham procedure done, that people may derive as, as much benefit. But as you say, it was on a background of maximal antianginal therapy. Um, but interesting, nonetheless, that people were still symptomatic yeah. despite the fact that they were on maximal antianginal therapies. Orbita 1, you know, is still a very important trial in my mind and one that's very dear to my heart also because it sets standards for how we do these trials. And in performing Orbiter 1, we were able to understand that they were feasible and ethical, and therefore it was easier to do a bigger trial that encompassed a broader um, set of patients that was more real world to kind of answer the question more clearly. So that transitions us nicely to, to Orbiter 2. So do you want to walk us through the, the design there and, and also the top line results? But yeah, so uh, Orbiter 2 was, again, a placebo-controlled trial of, of percutaneous coronary intervention for stable angina. As Rasha mentioned, we've, um, we took many of the, uh, uh, many similar aspects of Orbiter 2 in that these patients were all recruited. They'd either, uh, they'd either undergone um, a CCTA or a diagnostic coronary angiogram, showing as evidence of an anatomical stenosis. We enrolled them into a symptom uh, assessment period, which ran for two weeks prior to randomization. During this time, they documented their angina symptoms every single day using a dedicated smartphone app, which was something totally novel for this trial. Um, so they reported to us every day whether they'd had any angina and how many episodes had occurred. At enrollment, we did stop the antianginal medications, as we've discussed, but patients could restart them at any time in collaboration with the trial team. So they had 24-7 access to the trial team. And if their symptoms required it, they would restart their antianginal medication according to a protocol that we had pre-specified. Patients then came to the randomization visit, and essentially this, this worked in a similar way to the first Orbiter trial, in that all patients underwent vascular access, a coronary angiogram, pressure wire studies, 
and then they were sedated to a deep level of conscious sedation. Um, and at that point, they were then randomized either to the PCI arm or placebo. So the PCI group get complete revascularization um, of all ischemic stenoses at that visit. And the placebo arm just remained on the cath lab table without any further intervention. The follow-up phase was then 12 weeks. So patients were all discharged with dual antiplatelet therapy, then entered this 12-week period where they continued to uh, document their angina for us using this dedicated smartphone app. Um, and in terms of the results, our primary endpoint was uh, a novel and it was patient-centered. It was a, we call it the angina symptom score. And this was a composite endpoint of how much angina the patients had had, how much anti-anginal medication they had had to be restarted on, and any adverse events like acute coronary syndromes, um, unblinding for intolerable angina or death. Um, our primary result of the orbiter trial is that we found that PCI significantly improved the angina symptom score compared to placebo. Um, and because we had daily data, we were able to see the time course of that. We saw that very quickly following randomization, um, and it continued. That, that beneficial effect was seen all the way out to 12 weeks. Um, we found that patients in the PCI arm were about three times more likely to be free from angina at the end of the, at the, end of the follow up than those in the placebo arm. And actually, the, the beneficial effect of PCI was seen across a range of different endpoints. So looking at our um, CCS class data that was positive for PCI, as was our exercise treadmill time with about a 60 second advantage in the PCI arm. Orbiter One told us that if a patient is on antianginal therapy, that in that scenario, PCI may not, in fact, really have a marked improvement on, on symptoms. But in Orbiter Two, if they're not on antianginal therapy, that perhaps it does offer symptomatic improvement. Yeah. Do we think that the antianginal medication piece is the real effect modifier here? Or is it something else to do with how you selected these patients, the duration of follow-up, as a key difference in terms of the study design? It's interesting because actually, although the study was designed to recruit single and multi-vessel disease patients, actually 80% of them still had single vessel disease uh, once they were assessed for evidence of ischemia. Their symptom burden, their invasive physiological assessments, their burden of ischemia, they were relatively similar. What I guess was different was we assessed symptoms in a symptom assessment phase on the smartphone app. And if patients were asymptomatic this time, they were excluded from the trial. That could have had an impact. The follow-up was longer at 12 weeks, but we saw that immediate improvement in the PCI patients that was sustained throughout, so I don't think that made the difference. And yes, there was 101 extra patients, but I think that's unlikely to have made the difference. One of the things that could have contributed is the, the angina symptom score gave, gave us a daily score of their angina health status, which of course would increase the power to detect a benefit versus just having one follow-up data point as we had in Orbiter 1. I still think that impact of antianginals was probably quite important. And I think we're kind of left now with two pathways for our patients that we can consider as we kind of, you know, talk them through their options. Yeah, Chris, one of the interesting things to come from Orbiter 2 was the fact that even after PCI, the majority of patients were still describing ongoing yeah. anginal symptoms. Absolutely. So what explains that? Yeah. You know, what is causing those symptoms to continue despite the fact that in theory you've now revascularized a patient? Yeah. Yeah. Is it microvascular disease? Is something else going on? That's exactly correct. We found that 59% of our patients in the PCI arm still complained of some symptoms following PCI. Their symptoms may have improved, but they still had some residual, uh, some residual symptoms. Our trial wasn't designed to detect uh, microvascular status. Um, however, what we can say is that we had excellent resolution of ischemia in our PCI arm. And therefore, if the microvascular disease is detectable on standard ischemic testing, then we can rule that out, uh, that form of microvascular disease. Um, there is always diagnostic difficulty in uh, when we're looking at symptoms. And of course, there will be some patients with um, non-cardiac chain. Uh, chest pain in that in that cohort. We can't necessarily we we we're not we weren't designed to to look into that, but it's certainly the the source of further research for our group for sure. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because then it does make an argument for ha for perhaps doing antianginal therapy in addition to PCI if it is something like a you know microvascular issue where being on, for instance, a nitrate or something may help to ameliorate the yeah, symptoms. Yeah, but perhaps, I mean, some of the learning from that might come from Orbiter 1, because of course in Orbiter 1, they were on all those anti-anginal therapies. And still having anti And still, 
the similar proportion of patients remain symptomatic. So I'm not sure that, you know, if antianginal therapies do treat microvascular disease, and they clearly do to some extent, and perhaps we could think of other therapies in the future, but I don't think that's enough to explain it all. There's something about the link between symptoms and a stenosis that's not quite as linear as we expected, I think, and that's part of the story as we do more research. If you have a patient today with stable angina symptoms, do you feel that that is now an upfront conversation where you say path A would be to consider antianginal medications, or you also have a path A that starts really with, with PCI before even reaching for a medication option? Is that so what you feel like is the takeaway? I, I think it certainly can be, and I think a really important factor just to remember is that every patient is an, is an individual with different priorities and uh, different different you know uh, likes and dislikes some people some patients will be willing to take that small upfront risk uh, albeit with um, perhaps long term uh, you know management concerns uh, with pci and some patients will be uh, much happier with medications and everybody will be will, will have that individual uh, choice and it's nice that it's great that we now have data to support both pathways. Well, I think it also really reinforces the importance of doing these types of either sham or placebo, however you want to describe it, procedures, because I think that that does help to take an important element out of um, the question as to what is showing a benefit overall. So it really ends up being the cleaner experiment. And also what we've learned from both experiments or you know studies is that the blinded effect size is always much smaller than the unblinded effect size that we've seen before. And so that's kind of really important to consider. In clinical practice, we clearly deliver placebo as part of our medical care, and it's a good part of being a good physician. Um, and that will maximize the benefit of any symptomatic uh, relief that you'd expect from any therapy. Well, congratulations again, because I know that these studies are very hard to conduct, so, so congratulations, and I think it's an interesting one. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue.